I'm Blake Hargreaves, and this is Future Stops. The music you're hearing is from Canadian composer Tim Hecker's Juno Award-winning album Rave Death 1972. Hecker's soundscapes explore the full frequency spectrum through conventional instruments, digital processing, and studio craft. His evolving body of work, that spans over a dozen solo albums, has made him a fixture in the Canadian experimental music scene. Today on Future Stops, we explore Rave Death 1972, one of Tim Hecker's most successful albums to date, and the path that led him to the pipe organ in Iceland, where he recorded it. Uh, at her house, you know, when I was young, my grandma had an upright piano, and I would like, you know, just kind of amuse myself with that while I was bored. I don't know, I picked up instruments in elementary school, just in music class, but it was really in high school when I started listening to weird music and started to develop an interest in making music myself and i don't know just you know amateur hour tinkering i was not conservatory raised or trained i just kind of have been a student you know self-taught almost because it's kind of like a, <laughs> a steady you know slide from like asinine 80s pop into like you know, weirder and weirder music as i got older you know i think in high school we were trading tapes of like just you know, I don't know, British like music at the time, like 4AD label and stuff like Aphex Twin and New Order and just, you know, really um, now garden variety music was for me this kind of jewel of like across the ocean that I could only get at a, you know, like an import music store and or mail order. And I coveted that and I just kind of was drawn to, uh, let's say just like music that made me feel something. And that was like, you know, changing as my tastes developed as I got older. I was, you know, primarily interested in like digital audio. It's like a, a sculptural form and like really interested in like the vanguard of like laptop digital music and things like that. And I was trying to find ways to just like get out of the kind of like two dimensional screen and, you know, increasingly working more and more with like organic instrumentation and treating that as a sculptural basis for the music I was making. Still using, you know, a really resolute commitment to like digital approaches with sound and seeing it as like almost like a, a data stream you can manipulate and form into shapes. Also confusing uh, the real and the unreal, you know. Yeah, there's there's definitely like periods where I like grew as a musician or artist or whatever. You know, those those come in these like little epiphany moments. You know, surrounded by like doubt and questioning and insecurity and confusion and disorientation. You know, um, for me, it's like <laughs> it's not all like you know epiphany or success. It's like a real it's a minefield of like finding the path and you know it just takes like dedication and I don't know commitments and I've never really had um I've had vague notions of where I'm going you know with with a work you know when I'm working on it but I don't have this like singular crystallized you know need of something really specific I kind of let things evolve on their own kind of just shepherd that process this informal approach of letting things evolve on their own is reflected in the many bends in the road of Tim Hecker's formal education. I studied um, philosophy generally through my university years, and then I went into uh, history, uh, media studies, and I kind of, yeah, it was, my, my PhD was on uh, cultural studies of sound, I guess you'd call it. I did a historical analysis of loud sound the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, looking at, you know, ways in which 
people were obsessed with making music that was almost generative and loud and you know you know what's the acoustic equivalence of like uh, the Eiffel Tower or the Hoover Dam you know not to go right in but it, for me it was pipe organs in the early 20th century and I guess I was drawn into my like my doctoral phase like you know there's just all these books coming out at the time around noise abatement and noise control and noise regulation and I was like okay yeah there's this like you know rationalization of the public sphere push to control and measure sound but what about the flip side of that you know who are the people that were really interested in sonic potentials of you know increased amplification the you know use of electricity in music um, production and amplification all kinds of things you know and so I was drawn to that from I would say philosophical perspective which was that what what is that I don't know that's like a combination of a lot of my interests at the time but you know it was about the like enchantment of society despite the fact that there was this increased rationalization going on there was like you know forms of magic that were existing and proliferating through you know means of science ironically I would say up to like the late I don't know, 19th century it was a vessel of religion and its origins you know well at least from the 15th 16th century on was the you know theological apparatus of musical, uh, you know, fact or whatever. But by the early 20th century, uh, it was becoming more and more of a civic instrument. And what was interesting about it was just the, the ways in which technology and science and modern engineering was funneling in to transform that instrument from a mechanical, you know, foot pumping kind of bellows type of system to you know, something that was akin to a jet airplane, you know, using turbines and modern forms of pneumatics and uh, telephone-like uh, relay systems for the keys going through these massive buildings, architectures, and things like that. You know, at the time, one of the biggest instruments in the world at the Atlantic City uh, Convention Hall organ, and it's just, you know, an unreal feeling playing the lowest diaphone stops. I mean, it really... Sounds like um, a helicopter pushing air in a room. You know, it's really intense. Yeah, it was like, you know, and also I was drawn to it, obviously from an artistic perspective. There was a, you know, I grew up listening to like you know, Christopher Bowens, I forget his last name. And, you know, artists like Kevin Drum, who come from more of a noise perspective, he had this great record called Comedy, which was like this, this riff on a pipe organ being performed in a super repetitive fashion and it's just, you know, me magnificent. basically showed that there was a kind of sonic arms race that was happening in the early 20th century between a few rogue pipe organ builders who were competing with each other to build the world's loudest and loudest music instrument. Yeah, primarily focused on this one pipe organ builder named Robert Hope Jones, who was like a problematic character, and his life ended... Uh, in suicide, but yeah, I mean, he in, he invented a specific type of resonance stop called the diaphone. That yeah was a pipe that resonated with two discs basically instead of the normal reed type of system uh, that was often common. His background was a ironically a telephone systems engineer. Electro, he was an electronic engineer by profession before he got into music instruments, and you know he effectively 
I believe pioneered some of the designs of like relay types of wiring that, you know, the pipe organs electrical emergence uh, had parallels with the, you know, telephone industry and the, the technologies within telephone communication that was arising concurrently or just before it. And he was responsible for a bunch of things like that. While exploring the pipe organ in his PhD, Tim Heckard continued making music, releasing albums on the Chicago-based label Cranky. It's during this time that the pipe organ starts to transition from an academic pursuit into Hecker's music, leading to his Juno Award-winning album, Rave Death 1972. I was basically, you know, traveling around doing my research. You know, I've... Yeah, I, I studied because I was interested in it. I was doing my music practice, you know, at the same time. And I was, you know, traveling around a bunch, you know, through New Jersey and uh, where did I go? I went to Princeton, I went to Atlantic City, a few different places. And, you know, when I got back, I think later that summer, I decided to record on an organ uh, with one of my friends, uh, Ben Frost, in, in Iceland at the time. And I think that summer or maybe a year later, I, you know, I treated it kind of like, almost like a digital instrument in some ways. We put microphones inside the um, pipe organ, just close to the pipes, like right up inside the uh, casing for the pipes, and ran those through my computer and treated them and used you know, amplifiers and stuff in the space and recorded it from a bunch of um, creative ways. Yeah, it's like a, you know the two kind of blended into each other. I mean, it was like... Um, setting an approach and a general feeling of how things would unfold. But, you know, it was largely improvisational and was guided by, you know, some work I had prepared in advance. But a lot of what happened when I made that record was, you know, recorded that day improvisationally live with organ overlaid with treated digital aspects of that organ. So I would like just iteratively record um, riffs and treat them and, do things with them and then play over that almost like as a counterpoint and then track to everything as a kind of, you know, improvisational take, I guess you'd say. These initial experiments in Iceland are just the beginning of a process towards a finished work, a process which involves a heavy amount of craftsmanship, reinterpretation, and patience. I think I just like forget about it for a month or two and then just I, I rip into it and start you know, mixing and printing and overdubbing and using, um, you know, just transforming stuff till it, like, you know, has has a life of its own and the work is done. And that was like maybe, you know, a few weeks or something. And also it wasn't, I wasn't so precious about the work, you know, it's kind of ironic that, you know, I think I, I didn't really care. Like it felt like it was something I wanted to have like a roughness to it, even though now it seems like a, pretty well composed work it was done quite fast and quite sloppy and just for just like creatively it just felt like there's a uh, a vibe with the music and it's like it's done you know at a certain point you know where you've 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 made something that was special for you as a human being like it's hard to describe what that is I and mean, for me i knew you know i'd express something that i hoped for and maybe you know even surpassed it but it wasn't you know, wasn't like fulfilling the vision per se. It did, that record did really well. I remember, like, I, don't know, I was in Berlin at I think Club Transmedial, and there's like 800 people lined up outside or something to get in, and it was like, you know, it was kind of intense. Yeah, it was. It was beyond you know my hopes. It did really well. It was critically well received. Even got a Juno Award for that one. It was pretty funny. Under Electronic Best Electronic Album. I don't know, it was, a, it was a bizarre period. But I'm also grateful um, for that you know, interest and care in my work.
You're listening to the Future Stops podcast, an initiative of the Royal Canadian College of Organists. My name is Blake Hargreaves, and I'm your host as we explore the world of the 21st century organ. We just heard today's feature piece, In the Fog, by Tim Hecker, from his album Rave Death 1972. As an outsider to the organ world, working for years on a PhD thesis about loud sounds that heavily features the pipe organ, Tim Hecker has a unique perspective on the instrument. While his most successful album to date turns the spotlight on the pipe organ, the instrument itself is just the beginning of the process for Hecker, who sees the artistic potential for both organs and the sacred spaces where they live, along with the challenges they face today. I think it's been undervalued, at least in North America, there's no question. I mean, if you, I don't know what the state of the Atlantic City pipe organ is like now, but it was literally in shambles in like 2009, like brutal. Nobody cares about the pipe organ, you know, at least at that point. And it was, you know, a lot of geriatric volunteers who were helping, you know, keep that building kind of some semblance of sanity. But it was falling apart, and I don't even know if it still exists. Uh, But I think that interest in pipe organs will continue. You know, it's like not something that's going to go away. It's one of the, you know, it was the great form of, musical entertainment in the early 20th century like in terms of you know that like rising civic trend of like you know live musical entertainment like one of the biggest forms is to go to a pipe organ concert it was you know some of those loud organs were quite you know jaw-dropping you know awe-inspiring and yeah that's not not gonna there's a kind of hopefully a resilience with that and yeah, they're still in churches, they're still in spaces, they're not going to go away in any way. I mean, it's it's a question of how we as a society value it. That's like why I did this, this podcast, you know, it's like important to kind of talk about like these instruments and, you know, keep the interest going as much as we can. Because it's like, you know, without the care and, the, you know, then you don't get the technical expertise of people who know how to, you know, repair them or build them and carry on with those types of traditions. Played, I played in churches like all through my like performing life and it's like, you know, it's something you kind of put up with because some of the best acoustical spaces are cathedrals and the reverb is amazing and it's you know works so well with my music uh but the religious aspect is tedious and it's like you know i've (laughs) like been misquoted on this but i like to you know play with the secular kind of aspects of that you know and almost like a kind of gutted confusion almost like using you know religious music as a kind of Um, collage material or like a sculptural form but not making religious music out of it and it's not ironic either but it's something else the same thing like i'm not interested in affirming secularism at all like i still you know believe in you know some sense of the divine it's just i don't know if it's in the form of my catholic upbringing you know what i'm saying Tim Hecker's PhD thesis is a fascinating exploration of society's relationship with sound in the industrial age, and how that evolving relationship was reflected in technological changes to the design of the pipe organ. It is so compelling to learn about the concurrence of those studies with the creation of an album which evokes a profoundly sincere and complex emotional response using such a similar concept, an intersection of new digital technology and the pipe organ. The abstract, otherworldly sounds and atmospheres we heard today can leave us wondering where this music comes from. Learning about Tim Hecker's PhD studies of technology and the organ gives us a glimpse into how that process worked. We'd like to thank Tim Hecker for joining us on Future Stops today, and also thanks to Kevin Drum for providing a clip from his album, Comedy. You can find links to these albums and more on the Future Stops webpage or on our Facebook or Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to Future Stops. Future Stops is a podcast from the Royal Canadian College of Organists, produced by Andrew O'Connor, with Haley Raymond as community manager and executive producer Elizabeth Shannon. I'm Blake Hargreaves. Thanks for listening.